statement shortly. We've seen Alistair Campbell, the Prime Minister's official spokesman, here this evening. And behind me, actually uh, who's coming now. out now, but we, we can't uh, hear exactly what he's going to say. He, he's... Uh, yeah, okay. Fine. Get them to come back to me, please, on air. Michael Hassan. What did you say? Well, Hassan. He's confirmed they're happy with that was uh, the what we what we understand now is really just a confirmation from number 10 Downing Street that the air raids have begun. It, conf it uh, really matches what we heard from the White House just a few minutes before. That there are now air raids. That uh, we understand that British uh, warplanes will maybe not be involved tonight, but certainly be involved in those air raids on Iraq with the, within the coming days. But that was the official confirmation from here that air raids are on. But as yet, you think that British warplanes would begun. not be taking part in any first attacks in well, because last time they were intended to be involved weren't they yes there's, there's a lot of speculation about exactly what might be involved but the the best guess has to be that the first um, sweep would be from cruise missiles um, and when um, American military men were talking about this only a few months ago they said this won't be a few cruise missiles it would be several dozen there'd be several dozen cruise missile attacks on command and control sites within Iraq and of course crucially on air raid uh, on air missile defences that Iraq has, because Iraq is not just a third world country, it's a country with significant um, defence potential, um, and those missiles would be needed to um, destabilise, neutralise Iraq's air defences um, before any substantial uh, um, manned air raids were continued against Iraq. David Lloyd, thank you. We'll uh, come back to you, obviously, as we get further information to try and clear up all these points, and if Tony Blair obviously speaks. This is the scene in Baghdad where we have been watching what appears to be some anti-aircraft fire uh, into the night sky, which is the indication that some kind of raid had begun on, ba on Iraq. We have confirmation from the White House that the President has authorized attacks on Iraq. We have no details of exactly what those attacks are or where they will be. Tom Carver is in Washington. Perhaps he has more details of what exactly is going on. Tom, do you know any more than that brief statement which we heard from the White House? No, I think all we can do really is, is uh, read between the lines of that statement. As you heard, Joe Lockhart talked about a substantial strike. Those were the words that were used, if you remember, a month or so ago. And at that time, we were told by White House advisors that was when, of course, the strike was called off. And at that time, we were told that what they had in place was a strike lasting for several days, possibly up to a week, with wave after wave of uh, first cruise missile attacks and then going into a manned bomber attack. So I think we can expect something that, like that in this case today. It, it's customary, obviously, isn't it, on these occasions, people trail what kind of attack it might be so that no one is too surprised. Have there's, has there been the kind of official speculation so far which uh, would give you, or inspired speculation, which would give you any idea of what the range of targets would be, how long the first wave might continue? Well, you know, Brown, what the Pentagon has is what's called a rolling target list. Uh, literally hundreds of possible targets, I was told by one Pentagon official once, uh, are in that list and they are constantly updated. And they just basically scroll down that list and decide which are the most appropriate targets according to, first of all, the latest intelligence, because obviously some of the stuff that they want to destroy can easily be moved around. And so some targets go in and out of fashion, as it were. And the other thing is, of course, uh, the weather, because um, these targets are scattered all over Iraq, and the weather in some parts of Iraq might be better than others. So th it's a constantly changing uh, list of targets, but we know the, the kind of groups, obviously, the, the, the sort of targets they'll be going after, and the primary ones will be the weapons of mass destruction, because that is the primary aim of these airstrikes, is to wipe out Saddam's weapons of mass destruction, or at least to degrade them, as they say see that it is a very measured report. It goes through in considerable detail what those inspectors have been trying to do since they went back in in the middle of November. And sometimes, yes, they were able to get to sites that they needed to go to. On other occasions, they were not. And they said that there was more obstruction than usual. Michael. So that is the way this is all being set out and we shall hear more from the Prime Minister very shortly. Right, and, and while you've been talking to us, we've brought up pictures now that we're getting live from Baghdad. Uh, of the city there, which we know now is uh, about to be attacked uh, by American airstrikes. We know the airstrikes have begun. Uh, it's been confirmed both in Downing Street and by the White House. 
uh, that uh, the airstrikes have begun. Uh, it would appear that we're looking at a normal city, uh, traffic, traveling at about uh, almost half past three in the morning there. Electricity in good supply, television pictures beaming out. Uh, but we know that right. attacks have begun, so in, come back. and we're back straight to Downing Street, of course, as the Prime Minister comes out. Right. The Prime Minister is That's not through the doorway at the moment, but his official spokesman is out in the street. I think we would just have to wait, as usual, on these occasions. There may be some last-minute adjustments to the text. It's obviously very important that the Prime Minister wants to spell out in very precise language exactly why the action has been taken, what it is that justifies the action. So I suspect that there is um, some last-minute tuning going on there. Um, the uh, official spokesman just going back inside the door there. There has been a lot of consultation being going on all day around the capitals of Europe and, of course, a great deal of consultation at official level between London and Washington. As I said earlier, two phone calls in the last 24 hours between the Prime Minister and President Clinton. This all discussed quite brief calls because the two men obviously realized that it was likely to come to this. They will have had discussions about this. They will have known for some time exactly what it is that they are going to do. All right, Michael. Well, as we said, we will, of course, go straight back to Downing Street the moment that the Prime Minister uh, comes out of Number 10 Downing Street. In the meantime, let's look at live pictures again from... ...away from the problems he was in. That was the criticism we heard when the strikes nearly happened a month ago. And because everything is so much more critical now with the impeachment vote so close, I think you can be certain that Republicans are going to be that much more frustrated and are going to vent their anger on the president. Well, Tom, while we're talking to you, we are watching the pictures in Baghdad where things seem to have quietened down a little now. Uh, we had earlier uh, tracer and anti-aircraft fire going up into the sky, showing green and luminous on our screens uh, because of obviously the, the effects of the light, but no doubt um, lighting up the sky over Baghdad, but uh, nothing we have yet heard indicates that there have been any attacks on Baghdad itself. Indeed, we have no physical evidence of any airstrike at all, but we do have a statement from the White House which talks of a substantial military attack against Iraq and the promise within the hour of a statement from the White House. We are also watching uh, from uh, in Downing Street where we are hoping that Tony Blair, we believe that Tony Blair may soon step through the uh, through the door from Downing Street in order to make a statement about Britain's participation. We know that there are British tornadoes in the Gulf and that on the last occasion they were within a few minutes of takeoff so that they would have joined any first wave of attack but we are not clear on this occasion whether British forces are involved. Perhaps the Prime Minister, who's coming out now to make a statement, will be able to tell us more. Earlier today, I gave authority for UK forces to be deployed against Iraq. Operation Desert Fox was launched at 10 p.m. London time. There can be no greater responsibility upon a Prime Minister than to ask British servicemen to risk their lives for the sake of peace and stability in another part of the world. And I feel that responsibility tonight profoundly. I spoke earlier today to Group Captain Rich Jones, who is in charge of British forces in the Gulf. British involvement will be significant, and I thanked him and them for their bravery and for their professionalism. And I wish them well in what we would be asking of them. This action, of course, could have been avoided. Since the Gulf War, the entire international community has worked to stop Saddam Hussein from keeping and developing nuclear, chemical and biological weapons and from continuing to threaten his neighbours. For the safety and stability of the region and of the wider world, he cannot be allowed to do so. If he will not, through reason and diplomacy, abandon his weapons of mass destruction program, it must be degraded and diminished by military force. Over the past few years, as you all know, we have engaged in endless diplomacy at every level and of every kind. But we must face the facts. 
Saddam Hussein has no intention of abiding by the agreements he made. UN Resolution 687, bringing to an end the Gulf War, made it a condition of the ceasefire, both that Iraq destroy its weapons of mass destruction and agree to the monitoring of its obligation to destroy such weapons. Despite constant lies, prevarication and breaching of the agreed conditions, the weapons inspectors carried out their task, uncovering in the process vast evidence of weapons of mass destruction. In October last year, Saddam Hussein started to impede their work even more seriously than before. Months of negotiation followed. Finally, faced with the threat of force, Saddam Hussein averted military action by entering into a binding memorandum of understanding with Kofi Annan, the UN Secretary General. But despite that, he continued to obstruct. In August, he suspended cooperation with the UN inspectors. On October the 30th, he ended the cooperation totally. He resisted all appeals to come back into compliance with the agreements he made. Indeed, quite the contrary. He used the time both for further prevarication and for the dispersal of his military capability. As you know, on November the 14th, I issued the authority to strike against Iraq as part of a joint US-UK operation. At the last moment, aware that he was about to be attacked, Saddam offered full, unconditional, unrestricted cooperation with UNSCOM. Again, he made that promise. We called off that attack. We made that last extra effort to avoid the use of force. The inspectors, again, as you know, went back to work. We said at the time, very clearly, very directly, that we would hold Saddam to his word and that should he break that word once more, there would be no warnings, no wranglings, no last minute negotiations. So we made the position crystal clear to him and to the entirety of the world community. Richard Butler, the head of the UN Special Commission, promised his report on Iraqi cooperation within a month. It came out last night on time as scheduled. It is damning. It is a catalogue of obstruction. It shows quite clearly one more time that Saddam has no intention whatever of keeping to his word. He is a serial breaker of promises. And the reason for that obstruction, for breaking his word, is also now clear. It is his desire to develop these weapons of mass destruction. He has not for one instant yielded up that malign intent. The threat is now, and it is a threat to his neighbours, to his people, and to the security of the world. If therefore he is not stopped now, the consequences to our future peace are real and fundamental. We cannot responsibly let that happen. Let me remind you, since 1991, the inspectors destroyed or rendered harmless 48 Scud missiles, 40,000 chemical munitions, 690 tons of chemical weapons agents, 3,000 tons of precursor chemicals, and the Al-Hakam Biological Weapons Factory, destroyed in 1996. However, over 30,000 chemical weapons warheads and 4,000 tonnes of precursor chemicals remain unaccounted for. The UN and the world community have shown by the resolutions passed, calling for unconditional cooperation with the weapons inspectors, that they know fully the seriousness of the threat Saddam poses. Following the Butler report, 
after more than a year of obstruction and a catalogue of broken promises which I have outlined to you, we have no option but to act. Our objectives in this military action are clear. To degrade his capability to build and use weapons of mass destruction and to diminish the military threat he poses to his neighbours. The targets chosen, therefore, are targets connected with his military capability, his weapons of mass destruction capacity and his ability to threaten his neighbours. We are taking every possible care to avoid civilian casualties. I cannot, for obvious reasons, go into operational details. But I do want to say one further thing. Our quarrel is not with the Iraqi people. It never has been. The whole world should know that we have allowed Saddam to sell oil to buy as much food and medicine for the Iraqi people as is necessary. It is a lie for him to say otherwise. He could have fed and cared for his people, but he has chosen not to. Our quarrel is with him alone and the evil regime which he represents. There is no realistic alternative to military force. We are taking this military action with real regret, but also with real determination. We have exhausted all other avenues. We act because we must. And the Prime Minister turns away, takes no questions, as perhaps you would expect in the middle of such a, a, at the end of such a statement, but he has confirmed for us for the first time that uh, the, the degree of operation that is going on. Yeah. Desert Fox, the name of the operation, started at 10 o'clock uh, this evening. That's uh, just over half an hour ago, just under half an hour ago. British forces, he said, will play a significant part. He praised their bravery and professionalism and said he'd spoken to the, uh, the group captain who is in charge of British forces out there. The indication are, he said that the target, he said that every possible care will be taken to avoid civilian casualties, which would possibly indicate why the, uh, we have seen no sign of any immediate attack on Baghdad itself. And he announced what were the intentions, which is to degrade or diminish by military force the stockpiles of weapons which he believes Saddam Hussein is concealing uh, whereabouts in, the, uh, uh, in Iraq. In other words, this is what, what some people have called, if you can't have inspection by inspectors, then we will have to have inspection, then we will have to have inspection instead uh, by cruise missiles. Now, I'm joined here in the studio by uh, Zuhar Diab, Middle East analyst. Um, realistic targets that he's setting out there that uh, they are attempting to diminish his capacity to threaten his neighbors? Well, I have much doubt and many American military analysts have said that as well. What they can do really is say, destroy certain plant where chemical uh, precursors were made before. And we do not forget that all the inspectors and monitoring was going on. So what is left there? I, and we have to bear in mind that during the Gulf War, with all this intensive bombing, not one mobile launcher of Hussein missile was knocked out, only the fixed one. So we, it's very difficult to say. And now, if he's hiding those 10 or 15 uh, Hussein missiles, where are he is hiding them? Under the earth, maybe. Biological labs, biological weapons lab, where can be? In the basement. Can you spot them? But he was also suggesting that the other point of, of, of this attack is to diminish his military capability. Do you yeah, think that may, be, that may be a, a stronger uh, That's fine. Aspect. The conventional military capability, especially the presidential guards, the armored units, the air defenses, this is, you can knock out. This is a very easy, concrete target. But uh, to say about now what's left is the weapons of mass destruction, you can talk about software, documents. Now, software and documents, can you hit them with the cruise missiles? So it's a really, um, uh, my, uh, 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 my picture of the whole thing is a question about the regime.
this regime will not abide by anything because the whole thing started with the end of the Gulf War. We, we, heard, in, we heard today William Hague, the leader of the Conservative Party, saying that he wanted one of the objectives of, the, uh, of, of any air raids to be to take Saddam Hussein out of power, to, to actually d destroy his regime. Now, uh, that was one of the things at the end of the Gulf War. People said that the war was stopped before they'd achieved that objective, that yeah. they had failed to weaken him significantly. If they, st if they start from now, is it possible to so weaken him that uh, he would be susceptible to a revolt? Yeah, well, see, we have to see how the, the strike will develop uh, so far. Now, this is the, the, the other thing. If we are talking only about just uh, downgrading his military capability, whether on the, uh, on the, on the level of weapons mass destruction or the conventional uh, one, we are not really destabilizing him as such. To destabilize such a regime, you have to knock out really his military command, his uh, secret services, the party, wherever his presidential guards units uh, around Baghdad, because all these regimes, you know, this type of regime, they keep the loyal units around them. So we are talking his palaces, we are talking about massive scale strike. Are the Americans going to develop such a, a scale, which so to some internationally extent, would be accepted? So it depends on how long they have the political will and perhaps the diplomatic support it, to continue with the exactly attack. Exactly, for such an intensive, short and massive and really destabilized the regime. We have to wait and, and see. Zuhadad, thank you very much indeed. We were watching there the uh, pictures of, uh, from Baghdad, which we recorded a little earlier. Uh, no evidence of any attack on Baghdad itself but obviously some evidence there, although possibly before any attack was launched, some, uh, some evidence that uh, there was shooting in the air and air raid sirens going off, although we are told by Tony Blair that it wasn't until 10 p.m., that is just over half an hour ago, that the air raids actually started. So the, presumably the jumpiness before that was simply people worrying about what might happen rather than what actually happened, a warning to us not to get too carried away by what appears to be uh, action in front of the cameras. On this occasion, it was entirely self-generated. Uh, Samira. Thanks very much, Brian. Well, just to remind everyone that uh, we've had confirmation from Tony Blair that uh, uh, military action has been launched against Iraq. I'm joined now in the studio by uh, Riyad El-Tahir, who's chairman of uh, the organization Fred